Darfur. It's a place that has seen many years of conflict, violence, and even genocide. Despite these atrocities, many people don't even know where it is or what has happened there. I asked some people if they had heard of the conflict in Darfur. So yeah, could you tell me where you think Darfur might be? I have no idea. I <laughs> wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've never heard of it. If I had to guess, I'd probably go Eastern Europe. I don't even know if it's in Australia or not. <laughs> um, I'd, probably, I'd probably say it was in Australia, probably South Australia. I don't know. Yeah? Probably near... Near India? It's got to be... Yeah? Darfur is a region in Sudan in northeast Africa. And since 2003, over 300,000 people have died there from war, famine and disease. A further 2.7 million have become refugees. That's like taking the city of Brisbane in Australia. Imagine if all the city workers were dead and every single person in the suburbs had had to flee their homes. As you can imagine, the effects are catastrophic. But how did the conflict begin? In 2003, the Sudanese Liberation Army, or SLA, and the Justice and Equality Movement, or GEM, launched attacks against the central Khartoum government of Sudan. They were accusing Khartoum of oppressing black Africans in favour of Arab Sudanese, usually over issues of land and grazing rights. The Arab Janjaweed militia fought back and are accused of trying to cleanse Darfur's black Africans. Making the situation even worse are accusations that the Janjaweed were sponsored by Khartoum. Many accounts by refugees claimed that government aircraft would conduct air raids and this would be followed by a Janjaweed attack. The government has denied its support for the Janjaweed and has also refused to accept the UN's death toll of 300,000 people. Khartoum says that only 10,000 people have died in the conflict. In 2006, the Darfur Peace Agreement, known as the DPA, was brokered between Khartoum and the SLA as signatories. However, many other rebel groups did not sign the DPA and the conflict continued to escalate. In 2007, amidst the growing tension, the UN and the African Union brokered a first-of-its-kind hybrid peacekeeping mission called UNAMID. The mandate for UNAMID included the need to provide secure delivery of humanitarian assistance, to monitor ceasefire agreements and the security situation, to help implement the DPA, and to provide a secure situation for economic reconstruction and the rule of law. The use of force was only permitted where civilians were under imminent threat and to protect UNAMID personnel. But despite having one of the largest budgets ever for a peacekeeping mission at just over $1.5 billion, UNAMID has been unable to meet all of its mandates. Sarah Teat, from the Asia-Pacific Responsibility to Protect Centre in Brisbane, explains one of the reasons why UNAMID has not been able to meet its mandates due to a lack of signatories on the DPA. If you have significant numbers of, of belligerents um, or rebel groups, whoever, whomever it might be, who are not part of a peace agreement and the main mandate of, or the, some of the main tasks for fulfilling a mandate are then to um, monitor the peace agreement, it automatically limits not only the mandated tasks, but the overall picture of sustainable peace. The fact that the government has been implied in supporting the Janjaweed has made the path to peace even more complex. The bombings 
uh, that took place earlier this year, at least with the acquiescence of the government, but perhaps even with the backing of the government, have been incredibly problematic for sustainable peace in Darfur. There is, needs to be sustained international pressure and sustained sort of a, a good balance of carrots and sticks for Khartoum in particular. The kinds of international pressure used in Darfur has included armed embargoes, sanctions, and in 2008, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest for Sudanese President Bashir. Many have said the calls for Bashir's arrest are futile because many African states have refused to recognize the warrant. However, not all states share this view. Although the African Union took a, a, st a stance that they were not in support of the arrest warrant against Bashir, Bashir didn't attend a, um, a summit in Uganda because there was word that he would be arrested if he went to Uganda, and South Africa has also said that, it would, that they would arrest him. So the more um, pressure there is within the regional community, you, there's a multi-layered sort of pressure that, that begins to make the government realize that the international community is quite serious about holding it, it accountable for the attacks on civilians. Another big problem in Darfur's road to peace has been Unamid's military and personnel strength. Although Unamid is authorised to have just over 19,000 troops, it currently only has about two-thirds of this, which has made it incredibly difficult for Unamid to reach its mandate, particularly in terms of providing security and humanitarian assistance. And President Bashur has again played a part in this problem. Bashir was very clear in negotiating that the arrangements for UNAMED that he wanted it largely um, composed of or comprised of African Union troops. And if you look at sort of uh, um, the troop contributing nations for UNAMED, they largely are from African nations. If there had been um, fewer demands on behalf of the government for African Union forces, there might have been a possibility for a higher level of, of peacekeepers to be um, deployed from outside the African regions. But did Bashir intentionally seek to weaken UNAMID's force, or were there genuine reasons for this? I think that there are probably two sides of why Bashir, President Bashir would want to have African Union um, or African sourced peacekeepers. And one of the reasons would be uh, puts the pressure off a bit for him because it does mean that there's going to be a slow deployment. And, uh, however, the other side of it is I think that there's some real impact concerns. on it. He says that there's a, a international, a global order that favors a Western based system versus the other, um, and for him, I think that those are some legitimate concerns. Originally, the conflict broke out over issues to do with land and grazing rights, and many parties in the conflict, such as the SLA and the GEN, have argued that these legitimate concerns have not been properly addressed in the peace agreements. I think that if the fundamental root causes of a conflict are not addressed in a peace agreement, it's going to be very difficult for lasting peace to be achieved. These are, these are the reasons that folks go to war. That is what a peace agreement is supposed to deal with. It's supposed to deal with these deep-seated and, and you know, major problems. Recently, the outgoing Unamid military commander, Martin Luther Aguay, claimed that the majority of the conflict was over, with only isolated attacks and banditry being the region's main problems. But is this analysis too hopeful, given the length and severity of the conflict and the lack of signatories on significant peace agreements? To some extent, I think that that's ambitious, given the fact that there are still spoilers and there are still attacks on civilians. But the other side of it is, is that it's not the same conflict as it was in 2003 and 2004, when there were um, outcries that there was a genocide occurring in Darfur, but it's not as um, pervasive and all-out a conflict as it was in 2003-2004. With so many innocent people's lives at stake, what will the international response be in the future? How can we stop another genocide? I, I, 
I don't think the UN is equipped to carry out um, massive peace operations. We can't rely on troops. There's just not the capacity and unfortunately not the will. And I think that right now what we're going to be looking and what the UN system is really trying to do is look much, much more upstream at prevention and rather than reaction, you know, after after civilians have been slaughtered on mass.